In July, legislation took effect in Florida loosening firearm restrictions as gun violence across the state continues to surge. Gun rights advocates uh, and constitutional attorney Eric Friday recently spoke to us about the importance of the Second Amendment, contending it's one of the most important rights granted to U.S. citizens. Today, Jacksonville residents and policy advocates join us to discuss the human impact of the Second Amendment and the consequences of lax gun restrictions have that it has on our community. So joining us today are Katie Hathaway of Moms Demand Action. She's a volunteer. Hello, Katie. Good morning, Al. Thanks for having us. Of course. And Crystal Turner, local gun violence survivor and Moms Demand Action volunteer. Hello, Crystal. Hey, Al. Thanks for having us. And on the phone, we've got A.J. Jordan, Outreach Coordinator for Mad Dads in Jacksonville. A.J., how are you? I'm doing good, Al. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for calling in. So b- before we dive into the, the nuts and bolts of this conversation, because it's a really big and, and meaty conversation, uh, I want to ask all of you, like, how you got involved in this work, like what called you to it? Uh, and I'll start with uh, Katie. Um, people come to this movement all the time for various reasons, and I will share how I came to Moms to Man Action. It was back when my now seventh grader, he was seven years old at the time, I picked him up from school and he told me, his classroom was going to be the first shot up because it was closest to the front of the school. And my heart sank. And I knew I could no longer sit on the sidelines and continue to watch the devastation play out on the news every single day and not do anything. So I scheduled a meeting with my state lawmaker at the time. Um, He called himself the Florida gun lawyer. And I knew I was going to need some facts going in that meeting, not just my sheer raw emotions as a mother who was outraged. And so that's where I found Moms to Made Action. And I was able to um, bring those facts to that meeting with my state lawmaker. And I started a local group here. And I have since met far too many survivors of gun violence. And these are mothers and fathers who've lost their children using their pain and their voices, quite frankly, to for change. And so I once I met them, I knew I could not step away. And I'm in this for the long haul. Yeah. AJ, uh, can you tell me how you ended up uh, in this line of work? Well, actually, um, I come from a, my family has a nonprofit in Long Beach, California. My adopted father was in the Black Panther Party and started a nonprofit in uh, California. But then I moved to Jacksonville, got married, and my wife was a, used to be a journalist here in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and she met Donald Foy of Mad Dads, and she came home and was excited about this man that was making a difference in our community and said it would be a good place for me to start uh, my uh, service in Jacksonville. So I joined Mad Dads in uh, 2005. And uh, last but definitely not least, Crystal, can you tell me how how you got involved in this work? I became involved in this work um, April 1st, 2015, when two of my adult children, my daughter Janae at that time was 29 years old, and my son Donnell was 23 years old at that time, uh, were both murdered together in a double homicide. And um, like Katie said, being personally impacted and outraged, um, I began to advocate in my community because I didn't want anyone else to share that experience, the heartache, the heartbreak, Um, all of the emotions that um, a victim's family goes through after they've lost someone suddenly, tragically, and violently to gun violence. I found Moms Demand Action um, around 2016, uh, where I shared my story at a local event and became joined at the hip. Um, They have been an amazing organization to me to help educate me, not on just my personal story, but how I can use my personal story to impact um, good common sense gun laws that can change communities and save lives. Yeah. But first of all, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, Thank you. In the, in the loss of a child, I can only imagine the, uh, the devastation um, in, in all, every single part of your life. And, and to lose both of your children at that time is just, I, 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 I am not sure how you move forward through the day. Um, it's, it's gotta be extremely difficult. It is every day, um, is a new day. Um, and we often coin the phrase of now living a new normal without your children. Um, 
it is not just the emotion of burying a child, um, but it is oftentimes um, having to be present and understanding a system that you, from a distance, only knew of or only seen on TV, and now you find yourself sitting in that seat as a um, plaintiff along with whatever state you're in. Um, You find yourself now dealing and reeling with uh, probate court, um, so many different things, and just trying to figure out life. And in my situation, both of my children left children, so I am now a part of what's called grand families um, and parenting the second time around. They also left two other siblings um, that while I was grieving, I had to try and figure out as a mother, how do I support them? How do I support the nieces and nephews? And how do I support my community who was also impacted in the loss of my children because my daughter was a business owner um, in the community? So um, in doing child care at the time, there were hundreds of children who were impacted and having to be uprooted from a place that they came every day from a consistency of staff and teachers um, to now be moved somewhere else. And we don't think about um, those impacts when we talk about the fact that gun violence does not just affect the victim or the victim's family, that it impacts a community. There were jobs that Uh, were removed, there was income that was taken away from people for a period of time, that they now had to make adjustments. There were uh, my grandchildren and myself who had to make adjustments in how we were going to live, where we were going to live. Um, So there are so many different difficult conversations and adjustments that you have to make um, in a very short time period while, while also trying to still figure out and take in the fact that this experience has actually happened to you. So it's being present and being aware um, while dealing with your emotions. Yeah. We can have uh, all sorts of conversations about gun violence in the community, but I think when you uh, speak to somebody who has had to live through it, it it really takes on a different tone. Uh, I mean, like it's all theory and numbers until we get down to the actual human cost of it. Yes. Um, Right. I uh, recently, like a couple of weeks ago, it's, it's, it's always been my plan to, uh, I, I, I am a firm believer uh, in this show being a place where we can have uh, conversations and dive into deep topics. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, a lawyer on who is a, a Second Amendment um, constitutional attorney who's very much a gun advocate, Eric Friday. Um, and my idea was to talk to him and then, you know, talk to you guys and and really kind of give shape to this uh to this question that we're dealing with and uh when i was talking to eric uh one of the things that he brought up was uh the first uh, second amendment and the right to bear arms let me play some tape from that interview so you can hear exactly what he said number one we made a decision a long time ago in this country that the right to bear arms is a right that all citizens have we've not always lived up to that but i believe that that is the ultimate right that we have it is the right that protects every other right we have so that's eric's take on um um, eric friday's take on uh gun rights in this country and the second amendment katie how would you respond to that where the second amendment we're not trying to take away anyone's rights but rights come with responsibility and we we also have the ultimate right to go out in public and feel safe from gun violence, go to the grocery store, go to church, go to concerts, go to school and not die. Yeah. I was recently talking to a a friend of mine and she was telling me that her, uh, her daughter, uh, who I believe is in uh, first grade had done an active shooter drill and it just kind of broke her heart that she has to have this conversation, uh, with her daughter. Uh, AJ, it seems like uh, the the active shooter drills, um, they've proliferated in the last, I don't know, decade or so. Uh, what do you think that says about America? Uh, I think it says that we're in a state where our children don't feel safe at school and we have to have these drills so they will know what to do just in case somebody come in with with guns shooting at them. So they have to have bulletproof uh, backpacks and desks and know how to hide under the desk and all these different things they have to do now, you know, and uh, 
it takes away from their learning because they sitting in class wondering about a shooter instead of learning their math and their English. So it, it has really devastated our students and America in general. Yeah. Listen, uh, listeners out there, you can join the conversation. You can call us at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. First Coast Connect at WJCT.org. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Just to push back a little bit when we're, when we're talking about guns, I would say that, like, uh, I don't think it, it's it's confined to one demographic or to one community. I would just say that, like, where we are right now with the world, um, it feels like it's a little bit unraveling around us. Like, all the things that we thought that were norms are kind of going away. And it makes people fearful. It makes people think that, like, I need to worry about protecting myself. And so people want to go out and they, they, they want to protect their families. Um Recently, uh, we've we've seen all throughout Jacksonville um, a lot of murders happening, um, and then murders like you know. I mean, I think that when we talk about Jacksonville and we talk talk about gun violence, I could be uh, going out on a limb here, but I think that there because Jacksonville is so spread out that it'd be really easy for a lot of people to not worry and think about gun violence if they don't live in certain neighborhoods. Um, but then things happen that like cross over and everybody gets upset and wants to talk about it. But if it's not happening in, in, in their neighborhood specifically, we don't really have these conversations about the way gun violence is affecting people uh, in Jacksonville. So, so those are two different things that I, that I brought up. One is that like fear people. And, and I, I think that fear is not, you know, is, is, is not crazy. I think that, people have genuine fear about the way the world is going right now. Um, and so with that fear, they want to find ways to protect themselves and their families. Um, and then the second part of it is that gun violence in Jacksonville specifically tends to be concentrated in certain neighborhoods and the rest of the city just really doesn't want to think about it a lot. Um, you guys take either one. <laughs> it's multiple choice. Choose, choose, choose your, choose your, uh, your, your, your adventure. So when you speak about um, gun violence happening in Jacksonville in different communities, um, that's an accurate statement. And that unfortunately, until it actually knocks at your door, we don't necessarily get involved because we like to believe that it would never happen in our community. But we also know it to be very true that in so certain zip codes, it is happening more frequently and more often than we would like it to have. And it's happening in two different forms that um, is also very challenging. We first have what we call community violence, which is just uh, gun violence that's happening in a community for um, a different array of reasons, uh, which doesn't excuse the fact that it's happening. Uh, but it's something that we have to deal with. And when we deal with that, we have to also think about um, economics. We have to think about um, housing. We have to think about job security. We have to think about the systemic racism that um, our communities go through um, in some of the areas here in Jacksonville. Then we have the other set of violence that's happening um, that is more on the arise than we all like to think about. And that is uh, when people of color are now being targeted simply because of the color of their skin. Um, that's even more hard to acceptable to accept because I happen to be a black woman and there's nothing I can do about changing the color of my skin or um, asking someone to not like me um, or want to be my friend simply because of the way I was born and I happen to be born with a little bit more melatonin than someone else. Uh, when we think about that type of uh, gun violence, that's a gun violence that we don't like having that uncomfortable conversation because to have that conversation, then we have to talk about and admit that racism still does exist in our communities. Um, and as someone who's migrated from the North to the South, it has been a very big concern to me um, for my grandson and now I have to say even for my granddaughter we there was a period when we thought that the black man simply by being born um, was a concern that we thought that as that black young man grew up and became a young man that his life was going to be taken that he may not make it 
to the age of 18, let alone 25 because of gun violence. That fear is real for black people every day. And when we think about the most recent shooting, which was the shooting um, at the Dollar General over by Edward Waters University, um, personally, I was impacted because it took me back to my own loss. But it made me even more fearful because I work in a local grocery store here. And since that day, um, my emotions and my anxiety is probably on 200 percent because I keep thinking I could be the first victim because yeah. I'm near the door. Yeah. Katie, when when I'm I'm thinking about like what what I was talking about earlier with the idea that like people are afraid and when people are afraid and and worried about taking care of their family, um, you know, a gun having a gun in the house feels like um, feels like an action that you can take to like protect your your children. Absolutely, and I will just I, I people have that right, obviously, but I also have to point out that the gun lobby's extreme interpretation of the Second Amendment has helped get us to the situation where we have more guns than people in this country. And we have lawmakers sitting on their hands refusing to take action. And we, can, we have to stop voting for these people because we know action can be taken to address this crisis that we're in. Children are literally bearing the burden of inaction from our lawmakers, and it's unacceptable. Yeah. We're going to go to the phones. We've got Jeff in Arlington. Jeff, how are you this morning? I'm well, Al. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and I'm sorry to ask that. I know it's radio and you shouldn't ask that, but, um, so you, you can totally uh, ask how uh, I am. I think it's friendly. It's good. Well, yeah, but you're not supposed <laughs> to do those things. Um, uh, so gun violence. Um, so, um, so I, the only gun I have in my house is a 12 gauge shotgun that has, I can put three shells in and, and if somebody comes into the house, that that's a deterrent, but I don't believe that you need like what we have in um well the the uh culture that you need a handgun that holds i don't know how many rounds um and you don't need it to go out with uh, and that's the problem with what's going on and and i don't think it's a um a, a com um a community thing because it happens in arlington it happens at deerwood a uh, kid was shot you know, I don't know how long ago now, but for playing his music too loud at a, at a, the gas the, the gate in Deerwood. Um, so these things happen all over. It's not to me. It's not a particular neighborhood. It's everywhere. I you know I th I kind think worldwide. Yeah, no, Jeff. It it definitely is is an epidemic throughout the United States. I think that when you look at like the the statistics and numbers of of where it happens in Jacksonville. Uh, it it leans towards certain areas of town, but absolutely, like it 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 definitely affects every part of Jacksonville. Um, yeah, just the idea that like you know when you look at like the zip codes of where the majority of the violence happens, it it tends to happen in certain neighborhoods. But yes, your 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 point is well taken. Thanks so much for calling in, Jeff. Thanks, Al. Um, and we've got another call. We're gonna go to Stanley on the north side. Stanley, how you doing this morning? Yes, I'm doing fantastic to everybody. Um, we can talk about this this crime situation, but I'm a little appalled about the attorney when he made the comment. Uh, it's the the utmost uh, law that needs to take place in America. I thought freedom of speech, the right for people to be able to say uh, what needs to be said. And the reason why I'm saying this for the simple fact that when it comes to guns, until we do something about the guns, we need to decrease guns in America because it's so easy for people to be killed. Thank you. Stanley, thank you so much for calling in. Uh, to Stanley's point, um, and, and Katie, something that you said earlier, that like we have more guns in this country than we have people. Um, and so, you know, but I, I guess the, the bigger question that I have when it comes to that is um, because gun culture is so much a part of the fabric of American life, how do you, you know, take that out? And it feels to me like it has to be a national solution because when you look at, like, let's say uh, a city or a, a state like Illinois, 
that has really uh, gun laws on the books that they uh, that they absolutely, you know, uh, um, I don't want to say administer, but they absolutely uh, enforce. Uh, uh, and you see the violence happening in that state. And then when you look at like the gun viol- the guns that come in, they tend to come in from states that don't have as much gun restrictions and gun laws. Like literally, like you've got Illinois right here and Indiana Indiana is right next to it, and Indiana does not have the same laws. So if we do it state by state, it doesn't feel like it's actually going to decrease the vi- uh, the the violence. You're absolutely right about that. And people love to point to Chicago when we're talking about the gun violence and those states surrounding Illinois, like you said, do have lax gun laws. And so we absolutely need to tackle this at the federal level, implement stronger laws at that level. But we also know that our advocacy work, the way we do it, is a top-down, bottom-up approach. We need sustained investment in the communities most impacted. And we know that change happens first and foremost at the local level. And so um, I want to point out to you too, Al, like Florida has a preemption law. And so our local governments are completely, their hands are tied. They can't do anything to regulate guns or ammunition. But I always say that action can be taken still um, to reduce violence and that's sustained investment. And then also investing in community violence intervention programs. These are the boots on the ground organizations doing the heavy lifting in this movement every single day to reduce violence in Jacksonville. I, I, I want to understand a little bit about the, uh, the, the takes that your organizations have on guns in the community. So as Moms Demand Action, are you guys asking, um, like specifically, let me not put any words in your mouth, what, specifically, what are you asking legislators to do? Like, what is the number one thing on your legislative agenda? I mean, like I said, we, we absolutely need change at that federal level, but we are most and foremost advocating for those community violence intervention programs, the funding. I want to point out that our governor uh, vetoed $5 million from the state budget that was um, earmarked for community violence intervention. It was passed bipartisan this past session. So that's shameful. And he's also, um, we're one of few states that has not applied for up to $15 million in federal grant funding to come down here to address gun violence. And those are our taxpayer dollars not coming back to our state to address this. Mm -hmm. So I just want to highlight that. But also, like you said, federal, we need to close background check loopholes. Our law was written well before there was an online marketplace. Federal red flag law. We need to reinstate the assault weapons ban, the bipartisan assault weapons ban that we had in place back in 1994 and Congress let sunset after 10 years and didn't renew it. But then we also, like we said, state level, we need to advocate for um, stronger laws. They rolled them back last session. They passed permitless carry and went against the will of the majority of Floridians in the state. We're going to go to the phones. We've got Dave. Uh, Dave, how are you today? I'm doing great. Um, thanks for taking the call. And before I say anything, I just want to offer my sincere condolences to the lady who lost her children. Um, you have lived my worst fear. Um, <clears throat> recently, we had a, a, a scare at, at the school where, where we're located in Georgia, and my wife called. She was picking our children up, and she said, the police have surrounded the building. There's about 40 cops here, and they are clearing the buildings. And the horror that, you know, just as a parent, there's nothing you can do. Um, and, it, you know, one of, the, one of the things that came forward, there was a young man and he, he had uh, made a threat. And we have a small community and it, you know, really got me thinking the young man has no father. His, his, you know, his mother's working all the time. And so he's fallen through the cracks. And so I... And I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for common sense gun laws. You know, I'm, you know, I'm conservative. Yeah, sure. Great. I'm all for the second and wonderful. Fantastic. There's no reason we can't have common sense gun laws. But one of the things I always, and this is my question is, is, um, well, you know, what are we doing to really impact these young men's lives? Because violence tends to be perpetuated predominantly by young men. And um, just a, just a thought, you know, the, the rampant fatherlessness and the lack of good role models in, in these, in these children's lives is really contributing to, to the problem. And I'd love to hear, you know, if there's a program or any, any type of uh, um, organization that's really attempting to address those familial bonds. Thanks so much. Dave, thanks so much for calling in. AJ, do you want to take this one? 
Yeah, I take this one. Uh, Mad Dads, we have a program called uh, Black Top, and those coincide with our uh, Sankofa Life Skills Program. Uh, what we do, we take young men, young men from 5 to 18 years old, we get them on the basketball court just to get them in. We teach them the fundamentals of basketball, you know, team playing. From there, uh, we take them into the classroom and we teach them conflict resolution. We teach them uh, how to self-evaluate themselves. We teach them uh, how to apply for jobs. We take them on field trips. Uh, we have mentors that come in and talk to them from the sheriff's department to uh, the fire department to lawyers to TV, radio personalities. So we have a, we have programs. I guess what we are lacking is like most nonprofit organizations, it's funding. We have good programs to get the kids in, but without funding, it's hard to maintain that. Uh, Crystal, you, you, you nodded your head when he was talking about funding. Yeah, um, that's the biggest problem. We have amazing nonprofits that are boots on the ground, that are doing um, the work every day that um, unfortunately we don't get, we don't hear a lot of conversation about those local organizations such as uh, Mad Dad, such as um, Silent Women Speaking, such as Families of Slain Children, all of these organizations. The problem that we have is that when it comes to funding, oftentimes uh, we are blocked because of the application process. Uh, we're blocked because of restrictions um, that make it difficult for the funding. Um, as Katie mentioned earlier, when our governor did not take advantage of the federal funding um, that was allotted for the state of Florida, that is a hindrance when we talk about programs like Mad Dads who, who are out there and they're doing the work 24 hours a day. Um, we receive phone calls. Um, some of the other programs that are existing that are being created in terms of intervention, intervention um, is we're working towards the mental health pieces by putting together more peer support groups for families who need the emotional support, whether that be um, the perpetrator, the perpetrator's family, um, as well as the victim and the victim's families, because we also understand that when violence happens, gun violence, especially in a community, it is not just the family that's impacted, it is the whole community. So we have to look at this as a whole piece, and the funding has to be there in place to help these uh, small, local, boots on the ground, nonprofit organizations with millions of dollars, not just a couple of thousands of dollars to fund a program. Right. So we are talking about gun violence today, and with me I have Katie Hathaway from Moms Demand Action, a volunteer, Crystal Turner from a uh, local gun violence survivor and Moms Demand Action volunteer, and A.J. Jordan, outreach coordinator for Mad Dads in Jacksonville. So a couple weeks ago I had uh, Eric Friday, who is a uh, gun advocate and a lawyer, who talks a lot about the Second Amendment, and um one of the things he said was really interesting to me, and I want to play this for my panel. Uh, this is Eric just talking about the, the numbers uh, when it comes to uh, gun violence. There's a saying, figures lie and liars figure. Uh, to come up with 400 mass shootings, we have to include things like gang violence, which is a very disparate and definite separate thing from active killer situations. The solutions that we need for active killers, like the Dollar General situation, versus what we need to address gang violence are two very different things. The so same solutions do not work for both. Uh, Katie, I'm going to give that to you. What do you think? I just want to remind Mr. Friday that these are human lives we're talking about. These are not statistics. And I know Crystal can weigh in on that from a personal standpoint. I would say to... Mr. Friday, say that to the mother who is getting notification that her child's life has just been taken. Say that to the sibling who hears on social media that their sibling has just been murdered. Yeah. Say that to the mom who's standing over a white sheet and wondering, is that her child? Say that to me who drove up to the scene 
and seeing my daughter's body laying in a pool of blood in the middle of the street and my son covered in a white sheet when I had only been away from them for 20 minutes and the last thing I remember is them smiling and us laughing. We're not just numbers. Our loved ones are not just numbers. They are people who we not only loved, but now we're finding ways to live without them that will never ever get them back. And that people like Mr. Friday have turned into a number. But these are people who have names. These are people who were loved, still are loved, and are very much missed. When it comes to uh, gun violence and to the people who lose their lives over it, I think what happens, um, and I'm just you know speaking about society on the whole, uh, like you just had the, the mass shooting here um, uh, in Jacksonville, and I think... You know, for a couple of weeks, we're all thinking about those families and we all, uh, you know, we care. And I think we, we continue to care, but our focus goes away from that because life is busy and everybody gets caught up in their own lives and their own, you know, things that are going on or something else in the news takes our attention. And, 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 and as journalists, like we, we, we move on to the next story. Like we don't stay on that story uh, as long as the pain that the family has to feel like that doesn't end like it doesn't like like the moment we report on it and then we move on to the next thing that family is left with that tragedy with that that black hole uh in the middle of their family that they have to figure out and reorganize their whole lives around um and then it gets turned into a number and then that number uh doesn't have names it doesn't have heart it doesn't have emotion to it and we just keep going. And it seems that in this nation, even as the numbers go up, um, the action stays the exact same. We don't do anything. With that, I'm going to go to the phones. We've got Susan on the east side. Susan, how are you this morning? I'm great. This is Suzanne. How are you, Al? I'm good. I knew this was you. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. Um, uh, thank you so much for having this conversation. My condolences to those families um, who've lost loved ones and um, kudos to those who are being proactive um, in this mission. Um, you guys are aware of the challenges that we have in the east side of gun violence, whether it's gang related gun violence or community related gun violence. I agree um, that gun violence is just that. Um, and I echo uh, the sentiment and I like to um, ask of the gentleman that um, has mad dads um, to come uh, to the east side to assist us in this work. Uh, we have two apartment complexes that we've purchased, Lift Jack with a partner. Um, and um, there are several issues of gun violence in those apartments, but there are also several youth, um, not in those apartments, but also just in the neighborhood as a whole that can really use the mentorship and the assistance. Suzanne, thanks so much for calling in. Um, I, I, I have a, a, a bigger, like, harder question, right? Um, so when I think about gun violence um, and, uh, and, and politics and, and all of these things, um, I, tend to, I tend to be pessimistic. I, te I, I tend to think that, like, it's not going to change because... We saw what happened in Newtown uh, with, you know, all these kids who were killed. Uh, horrible, horrible tragedy that, uh, you know, f for me, like, just thinking about it, just, you know, ugh. Um, and we didn't do anything. Let me rephrase. Like, our politicians didn't do anything. Uh, we talked about it. We uh, had big debates but nothing actually changed. And so my, my question to you, my panel, is um, how do you keep doing this work when examples like that um, tell you that, like, this country, or at least the political class of this country, really has no power, or, or let me say, let me rephrase that, no will to change anything? I can echo that. 100% and it's it, it can be extremely frustrating. This work is not easy. Um, it's we organize through tears a lot of the time because we are humans as well. And we are seeing the 
our nation is traumatized. It's literally bleeding and and our lawmakers are not doing much on this. And I I know it's hard like to say like not change isn't happening, but there are little increments happening. We passed the bipartisan Safer Communities Act last year, Congress first time in decades. Um, so that was significant even though it was a baby step and we know there's more work to do. And unfortunately, change is set up to happen very slowly, especially at the federal level. And that can be extremely frustrating. But I refuse to let this be our normal. We're the only nation in the world that has this crisis and has normalized children. Uh, guns being the number one killer of kids. That's not OK. And I'm a mother and I will do whatever I can to enact change. We're going to go to the phones. We've got uh, Jean in Jack's Beach. Jean, how are you this morning? I'm good, thank you. I just wanted to do a little um, commentary about Mr. Friday's comment about one solution isn't doesn't address all um, gun violence. And I think the people that you have on today absolutely show that. We're talking about violence interrupters and supporting young men and young children or young people growing up. That addresses some of the socioeconomic issues and the, the mentoring issues. The laws, gun laws, like background checks. Background checks um, help stop gun trafficking, which then stops some of the gun violence, the crime gun violence. So I think all of these groups are working at multiple ways. No one's saying there's one magic um, solution. There are multiple solutions, just like in every safety organization or every safety program. We have to plug all of the holes, and I think all of these organizations are doing just that. Gene, thanks so much for calling in. Uh, one thing that I think... Al, go ahead, go ahead, AJ, go ahead. And I, I just want to address an uh, uh, issue with the gun issue here. Is, um, we also have to deal with uh, illegal guns that in our community that's really when we talk about community crimes and stuff like that a lot of those guns that's being used are stolen out of cars and houses and in nature so we have to educate we have to continue to educate our public to take their guns out their cars and lock them up in their house safely and and and, and keep them out of reach of children. We we haven't really talked about that, and that could help reduce some of the the gun violence if we just do those simple things. Yeah, thank you, AJ. Uh, we're going to go to the phones. We've got Biko in Jacksonville. Biko. Oh, hey, yeah. How you doing, man? Thanks I'm, for allowing me to come on here today. I'm good, but but, but you, you can't come on and, and, and me not introduce you. Biko is a young man that I mentored back when he was what how old were you 12 yeah 12 <laughs> and now he's a grown man calling into my show how you doing man hey man i'm doing well man good to hear your voice and you all doing well and like, um uh, i'm glad that i called in you know so uh i've been working as a uh gun uh, as an outreach for a uh, gun violence prevention program here on the east side so uh you know i hear a lot of callers uh calling in and just um you know some of those are are, are great but we still what I have been struggling with is our city leader not able to have that urgent, that urgent response when some of these, some of these youth need that have been experienced with gun violence. Instead, you know, we, we go through a hurdle as an outreach. I have to call a million people, have to go this, have to go that. When a lot of our issues that a lot of young, young people, you know, go through, you need a, a urgent response. I mean, immediately. So I deal with participants that is, you know, today or tomorrow, they might pick up a gun and go kill somebody. Or today or tomorrow, they might end up dying. So, you know, just uh, uh, just being in that work and just kind of experiencing some of the participants that have lost their lives, participants that also have killed somebody. So, you know, this uh, this work, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of mentally, you know, spiritually, it takes a lot of hold on me. And sometimes I just wonder, like, how do I continue to be in this work? But at the same time, El, you remember when I got shot. Yeah, I was about know, to say that like, you should, like... Right let people know that you are a victim of gun violence. You've been so shot. I had, right, right. So being that, what, I got shot when I was uh, 15, then turned around that 17-year-old, got shot again. So, you know, one of the one of the comments came on here and then said about how access it is for youth to get guns. You know, so we live in a culture of guns. We see them advertised everywhere we go. We have gun fair come on every, what, every year here. So 
it's those things already in place. So we need to work on getting to the youth and educating them at the at the real tender age. So if I would have known about gun violence and gun safety while I was young, it would have probably most likely prevent me from either picking up a gun or, you know what I'm saying, or just thinking about uh, uh, me having a gun to go retaliate is a, is a means yeah. of ending Pico, my, my, my conflict. Pico, we have to wrap up this segment. Thank you so much for calling in. I'm going to let uh, my panel respond to you. I think when we um, talk about just what uh, Pico said and what um, Al said, when we think about the determinant, um, and that road to getting intervention programs, it comes from our politicians who are not well connected within the communities that they serve. And what I mean by that is that um, if you've never been impacted by gun violence personally, you don't see the other side of it, of how it makes you feel, then of course you don't understand that it's a real existing thing. Thank you so much. Katie Hathaway, Crystal Turner, and AJ Jordan, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me about this big issue.